Hi folks, welcome to lecture six in this eight part series of lectures on New Testament Christology. I have had a blast. I hope that you're having a good time and I hope that you learned something from this lecture here on Pauline Christology. Now, why have a distinct lecture on Paul and particularly his depiction of Jesus as divine? Um, the reason for that is really twofold. Um, or may, may, maybe more than twofold, but let, let me just list some of these points. The first is that Paul provides us at least his authentic letters, and I've mentioned in previous lectures that uh, there's a dispute about which of Paul's letters go back to Paul himself and which ones might have been written by associates of Paul, etc., etc. I don't want to get too bogged down in that. But nevertheless, all scholars agree that letters which are authentically Pauline are our early, probably our earliest evidence we have of what was going on in earliest Christianity. And so we discuss Paul because he's early. He goes close to source, as it were. Uh, the second reason we discuss Paul is because we have quite a bit of writing from Paul. He wrote numerous letters which allow us into the thought world of one particular and particularly brilliant early Christian thinker in a way that we can't really get into the thought world of any of the other early Christian thinkers. Say 1st and 2nd Peter are written by the same person. Say 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, whatever. Of course, we have the letter to the Hebrews. We have James. We have Jude. We have other books. But you can't really go inside those bodies of text and be in quite as large and coherent a universe, a theological universe, as one can when one walks into the universe of Paul's theological discourse. And so that's the other reason. The, the, the third reason, and there perhaps could be others, is that Paul is a particularly fascinating thinker for the development of theology in general and perhaps for the development of Christology in particular. Paul is an early first century, well, well in terms of his life, early to mid first century, Jewish monotheist that has spent time in Tarsus of Cilicia, which is a, a Greek town, a highly philosophical town, a college town, if you like. And so he's imbibed lots of stuff going on in the Greek philosophical world, which will, which has been important in the Mediterranean world, which will go on to be important in the development of Christian theology and not least Christological reflections, so that's interesting. Paul also is an ex pharisee so he's rigorously and robustly committed to the Jewish tradition, probably has some competency in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And so for these various reasons, Paul's grounded in the early Jewish tradition. He's reaching out as a missionary into the wider Greco-Roman world. He's uh, robustly committed to the Jewish biblical, theological, conceptual tradition, but nevertheless he's aware of the Greek philosophical tradition. So all of this is coming rushing together and it makes Paul a particularly interesting figure for reflection. Now a thousand things could be said about Paul's Christology. I here only intend to mention a few because I don't want to give you a three-hour lecture. I want to give you a lecture that's just 10 or 12 minutes. The first thing is Paul's very early, and his letters reflect a view of Jesus as divine. And I've said this over and over in other lectures because it's very important. And Paul doesn't seem to think that this is a unique view that he has. That Well, I think Jesus is divine, but I've really got to be careful because others don't think that. Or I think Jesus is divine, and I've really got to convince others of that. Or I think Jesus is divine, and some of my churches agree, but the Jerusalem apostles don't agree, and the churches that they've established don't agree. Excuse me. So it's, that's not the case in Paul's letters. There seems to be agreement at an early point that Jesus is divine. There's obviously agreement that Jesus is fully human. I won't say much about that at this point, but that agreement is obviously there as well. But a couple of features of Paul's letters which we might highlight. I want to say the opening and closing of Paul's letters are theologically and Christologically explosive. Let me tell you, within the world of Jewish monotheistic thought, it's an astonishing epistolary development as it is, of course, a theological development. To open a letter talking about divine grace and peace coming from the origins of the universe 
to the recipients in Galatia or Rome or Corinth or wherever and bifurcating the, the, the way in which one talks about the divine origin of that grace and peace. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just God the Father that is the source of the divine grace and peace. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul casually opens his letters that way. This Jesus Christ is the same human being recently who walked the earth and was brutally executed. And now he's included casually, as it were, within a monotheistic grace and peace uh, introduction, preface to a letter. Absolutely astonishing development. When Paul ends some of his letters, he has this same kind of conception at work in his theology or his Christology. In the case of 2 Corinthians, in his pneumatology, it's a Trinitarian formulation when Paul signs all the letter to 2 Corinthians from God the Father, Jesus the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. So lots going on there in apparently not important parts of the letters. No, those are crucial parts of those letters, and don't miss them. A couple of other things. It's clear in 1 Thessalonians 3 that Jesus is an exalted and divine figure to whom Paul prays and whom Paul expects to have the divine power to answer his prayers. It's clear in 1 Corinthians 11 and other places that Jesus is central to the devotional life of the early Christian community in terms of the Lord's Supper, the Kuriakon Depnon, which is the Kurios in that case is Jesus, and Jesus is the divine figure into which people are baptized. See that also in Romans 6, the way in which Jesus is featuring in the life of these believers. We also see, like I said, thousands of things I could say. I'm only going to mention a few things. We also see in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and Colossians 1, 15 and in a few other places that it's taken for granted that Jesus, Philippians 2, 6 as well, that Jesus pre-existed the creation of the cosmos in some sense and was in, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and in, and in Colossians 1, 15, the divine means by which God created the universe. That is, Jesus, in his pre-existent state, is conceived of as intrinsic to the most exclusive category of first century Jewish monotheism, that is, the category of the creator of the cosmos. So that is an astonishing development. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Jesus is included, and this is a bit of technical exegesis, but Jesus is included within Paul's reworked version of what's called the Jewish Shema. The Shema comes from Deuteronomy 6.4. It goes like this in English. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. It's a simple formula of uh, that Jews would pray to mark themselves out as faithful Jewish monotheists over against pagan polytheists. And Paul seems to... Um, uh, seems to write out that prayer in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, but now Jesus is included within that prayer. He says, so there, though that for the pagans, this is 1 Corinthians 8, 4, and 5, though for the pagans there are many lords and many gods in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is one God, he's Theos, one God, the Father, from whom are all things and we to him, and one Lord, he's Kurios, one Lord, through whom are all things, and we through him. What Paul seems to have done in this one God, one Lord formulation is to take the reference to one God and one Lord in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Jewish Shema, which Jews prayed on a regular basis. Some would have had written on their doorposts at home, and some would have had it on uh, other places as well. Paul seems to have taken that and included the crucified, resurrected, and glorified Jesus of Nazareth within it, such that Jesus is not just a theoretical part of Paul's cosmological thinking that, oh, isn't it interesting that I think about God really without much reference to Jesus, but I can sort of tack Jesus on conceptually if I need to or want to. No, Jesus the pre-existent, then incarnate, then personalized through his life, death, resurrection, and exaltation, still human Jesus, 
has become intrinsic to, colored, characterized, and conditioned everything that Paul says and thinks about the origins of the universe, the nature of the universe, the God of the universe, such that Paul's entire life has become a life lived before the God revealed in Christ. Um, a thousand more things could be said, but already in Paul's letters, you see an absolutely robust view of Jesus as fully divine, fully human, as intrinsic to the one God, fully divine, but is distinguishable within that one God from a being, from a person that God calls, or that Paul calls the Father. And so this is an amazing development within Christian thought, and I hope that you've enjoyed some of these reflections, and I look forward next time to talking about Gospels Christology.